Okay, back in the olden days, people had to use on paper calculations to build their Tesla coils. But uh, the new generation of coilers are spoiled because we have Java TC, but a lot of people actually don't know how to use it. And I've gotten a couple of requests on a tutorial of how to use it. So we're gonna, we're gonna break down Java TC today. I first started using it in the pandemic and it has been my loyal friend and companion since. Let's start with the first part, the secondary coil, which is right here. So the radius, you have, you notice that you have two inputs for the radius, and that's because sometimes people will wind conical secondaries and the radius will be bigger at the bottom than at the top or vice versa. But if you're a normal person, you wind a helical se secondary coil and your radius one and radius two will be exactly the same. For example, with my latest Tesla coil that I'm building right now, Project Achilles, will have a three inch radius at both the top and bottom. So that means it's a six inch in diameter coil. And then the height right here, this shows how high the low voltage end of the secondary coil is above the ground and how high the high voltage end of the secondary coil is above the ground. So the high voltage end, I want to be 24.125 inches above the ground. Don't ask how I came up with that number. I just adjusted it according to my coupling, which we'll talk about later. And then I wanted a one to four coil ratio, which I would also recommend for your secondary coil. That means it's four times longer than it is wide. So that means if I have a six inch in diameter coil, I want a 24 inch winding. So 24.125 plus 24 is 48.125. I'm so good at math. Um, K turns. You notice that you have a little calculator tool right here. Is it getting this? I really hope it's getting this. Okay, never mind. It's loading. We're good. And you have all these little inputs here, and it will show you how many turns you have on your coil based on certain details. There are a couple things that are kind of finicky about this that make me not want to use it for the secondary coil, and that's because it lists the bare wire diameter and the insulation th thickness, which lit I literally don't know with magnet wire. So I mostly just skip this and save it for the primary coil. From my experience, there's usually going to be about 0.003 to 0.004 inches between turns on your secondary coil. So I would end up just adding turns until there's about 0.0035 inches between your coil. I mean, between your windings, sorry. And I'm using 26 gauge magnet wire. I wouldn't recommend using th thinner than 32 gauge just because it starts to get really easy to break the wire. That's me, that's my secondary coil right there. And if we go down here, click Run Java, Java TC, you will see a little diagram right here and it shows what your coil will look like, proportionally at least, um, and that's a nice shape to me. So we'll talk about the values later. Right now we're gonna talk about the primary coil. The radius one and the radius two are actually gonna be different here in most cases, unless you're using a helical primary coil like some people do for the convenience. If you're doing a flat spiral coil, like I am for Achilles, your, your first radius, radius one, is going to be how far the inside of the primary coil is from the center of the secondary coil. So if you center all this out, it's gonna be the center of the primary coil as well. So make sure everything is centered because that would be so wonderful. So my radius is going to be five inches. So that means it's gonna be 10 inches across on the inside of the primary coil. And that should leave about two inches of clearance on each side between the primary coil and the secondary coil, which is great. As for radius two, that's gonna be the radius of the whole primary coil, how far the outside of the primary coil is from the center of the primary coil, center of the primary coil. Anyway, that should be about 10 inches for me. Um, and depending on how you put these values in, it will affect the number of turns that you have, as well as how thick your wire is and what the distance is. Here's the nice thing about a flat spiral. Height one and height two are exactly the same, which is great, and I have mine sitting two feet above the ground. This is where I actually do want to use the calculator. So we just put our values in again, so five, 10, 24, 24, and then bare wire diameter. This is where, this is, so this is where I'm gonna recommend that you actually use copper tubing because it'll be easier to put this value in. If you used like eight gauge or six gauge wire, you're gonna to have to go and Google what American wire gauge is in inches, and that's just a little bit more of a hassle than you need, and it's also just a nightmare to work with solid core stuff like that. So 
I'm personally using quarter inch tubing and there's no insulation which is great and the spacing between turns I'm also doing the quarter of an inch and if we press calculate right here it will give you the number of turns and that's 10 10 turns which is great so now we can just put that in here and mention that we have 0.25 inch tubing let's talk about designing a toroid now this is where things get a little bit simpler which is nice the minor diameter and the major diameter I had trouble with this when I was 15 years old so the minor diameter is going to be how thick your top load is so if you're using dryer duct that's going to be how thick your dryer duct is so most dryer duct will be about four inches four and a half inches which is the minor diameter of Odysseus's top load but since we're special with Achilles I have six inch tubing that I'm going to use so my minor diameter is going to be six inches and the major diameter is pretty easy it's just how wide across your top load is and for me that's going to be 36 inches we have we have a big top load for Achilles so the center height is going to be how high the center of your torus is going to be from off the ground so if we added three inches to our height two on our secondary coil the bottom of our torus should sit right on top of the secondary winding which we don't want but that's just to show you kind of where center height will place this so if we had our center height at 51.125 then we add that and boom it sits right on top just right there now I don't like that personally so I have my top load sitting at 60 inches 60 inches sorry for good clearance and yeah so that's a lot of clearance right there but I also want it to be kind of a tall Tesla coil so there's a little bit of a gap right there just so I can flex how high uh, off the ground my Tesla coil is so there you go that's how you design a toroid and uh, some people will have a sphere and you know, sphere will usually have a same horizontal vertical diameter. So if we had this at 70 inches and we added that, it's boom, right there. But I don't have a sphere, so that's just kind of to show you. Now let's talk about all of this. Oh, wait a minute. We forgot to talk about something with the primary coil. The primary resonant frequency is heavily reliant on the tank capacitance, which we have not inputted at all. What you want to do with a dual MOT setup is actually have it sit between 40 and 100 nanofarads. I personally have mine at like 55 nanofarads. Oh boy. No, so it's 0 0.055. And then we run Java TC and boom, we have about 100 kilohertz on the primary coil and just a little higher on the secondary coil. And by the way, this is okay. This is okay that they have a 10 kilohertz gap. You do not want to smash your head into your computer trying to get those two numbers to be exactly the same because they really don't have to be. In fact, if they were in real life, that would be bad because if the, if the Tesla coil is too efficient, it will end up harboring more power than it is capable of actually containing and you will start breaking stuff. If that's the, it's the same reason why you shouldn't have exact, the exact resonant capacitance value that is good for your transformer, good for your transformer because it might destroy your transformer. It might destroy your capacitors. So that's what we're going to talk about next, actually, uh, after we talk about these, is larger than resonant value. But for now, let's talk about these values. There's a lot of numbers here. Which of these do you actually have to worry about? Well, obviously, you want to worry about your resonant frequencies here. Um, make sure these are within like 15, 20 kilohertz of each other, and then you should be golden. Personally, I like to keep mine within 10 kilohertz but it, I guess it doesn't really matter. Um, let's see, Ch -ch -ch space between turns. Can you see how I have 0 0.00326 inches between each turn? That means that's roughly a correct amount of turns that I've got on there so far. And the weight of the wire, this is helpful for shopping. I knew to buy two and a half pounds of my wire instead of one pound of my wire because of this value right here. It showed me that I need 1.51 pounds and unfortunately I couldn't just buy a two pound spool I had to buy a two and a half pound spool but that's okay we have extra for later and you have that same little thing over here somewhere the length of the wire for the primary coil that's another useful tool why can't I highlight things okay it says here that I need 40 feet of copper tubing which I have 50 so that's good that leaves a little extra for a strike rail um, and that's also useful for shopping 
Proximity between turns. Da, 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 da. Okay, here's some important stuff. Coupling coefficient. So based on how close your coils are, it's going to have a certain coupling coefficient, which represents how much energy from the primary coil is actually making it into the secondary coil. And usually you don't want this value to be very high because a normal transformer would have it between 0.8 and 0.99, which is super high. Uh, if a Tesla coil had a coupling coefficient that high, if that was even possible, it would be so ridiculously efficient that it would just immediately kill itself. So the recommended coupling coefficient here is 1 point, I mean, 0.135, sorry, and I have mine just ever so slightly higher. Let's see what happens if I have this a quarter inch higher than it is. So 48.25, and we move that up a little bit. So the coupling coefficient is actually exactly on point with where we drilled the holes. So that's a relief because I didn't mean to drill the holes an eighth of an inch higher than I was supposed to. But I guess we'll, I guess we'll stick with that. I think I'll keep that. So let's see. What am I missing here? What am I missing here? Um, top loop capacitance is right there. And then there's some other stuff that are like useful for more specific like deep dives into your Tesla coil. But personally, the only values that I've actually used are the recommended coupling coefficient stuff, the resonant frequencies, the percent detuned, which tells you how detuned your Tesla coil is, um, which is nice. And then length of the wire, weight of the wire. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much all you get out of this. And then it shows you a little diagram right here, which is very nice. Uh, now let's talk about power calculations. This is just for spark gap Tesla coils and rotary spark gap Tesla coils. This is how much power is going into your Tesla coil. So if you're an American boy like me, you have 120 volts input. And let's say the voltage output, for me, it's about 4,500 volts. And the milliamperage, I think it's about 400 milliamps. And honestly, this stuff you don't need to be super exact on, just just fairly accurate on, because the most important thing about this is finding uh, what capacitance you should have in your primary circuit, um, and this will actually <laughs> this will actually throw you under the bus for dual mount setups because it'll tell you you need half a microfarad, which is bull crap. I'm an American boy, so I use 60 hertz. And I'm applying 120 volts. Now, because I don't have a big enough variac to power my dual mount setup, I have to ballast it at 10 amps. So I actually have it. Oh, I ballasted it at like 9.5 amps. It's like just barely under. It's a resistive load, so we shouldn't face some serious current spikes. Boom. So see, it's saying that the resonant gap size is actually a quarter of a microfarad. My mistake. Uh, but that's obviously way too high. We're not going to put 250 nanofarads into the tank capacitor. That's ridiculous. So what we're going to do instead is just use a 50 nanofarad capacitor. You should very, very rarely ever have to go above 100 nanofarads. I've seen a couple cases where people do go above 100 nanofarads for uh, microwave oven transformer Tesla coils, but most of the time, just if you're using a dual mod setup, a 40 to 80 is good. Like, I'm using 55, which is a pretty good value. Um, but, yeah, don't listen to the spark, lap, spark length, by the way, because that is also a load of crap, and it's not actually very helpful. So, now let's talk about the rotary gap design. So, I'm using a rotary spark gap. And the number of stationary gaps. So, there's going to be spinning electrodes, and then there's going to be two that are standing still. And... Well, that's for my Tesla coil, but some people have more than one static gap. I personally just have one stationary gap. And number of rotating electrodes. I would recommend at least four. That reduces wear across all the electrodes. Um, it also allows for high BPS at low speeds, which is nice. So I have four because I also want to do 100 BPS. So the disk RPM, you could actually change, change this. So let's have it at 3,000. That's a pretty standard number. And then the rotating electrode diameter, I have 0.125 inches, eighth inch uh, electrodes. And then the stationary electrode diameter, I have the same. Um, and then the rotating path diameter, the wider this is, the smaller your mechanical dwell time is going to be, which means, basically that means there will be less time that your electrodes are actually in front of each other. And that's good. Uh, if you want to keep that 
like above 100 microseconds, but below 250 microseconds, that's great. I wouldn't go above or below that just because that allows for poor quenching, poor energy transfer. Um, so I have a seven and a half inch diameter uh, of a rotating path. And if I calculate that, it looks like my dwell time is going to be 212 microseconds, which is good. I have 200 breaks per second. And the percent that my spark gap is charged is almost all the way, which is, oh boy. Well, you know what? I'll worry about this later. There's some values to play with there. Um, 200 BPS is a pretty good break rate to fall back on. Now let's talk about static gap design. This is what most people do because it's way easier to do this than a rot rotary spark gap. So most people just have two electrodes. Um, they're like a quarter of an inch in diameter and spaced by like another quarter of an inch and calculate, boom. So apparently my gap distance is too wide because my voltage is only 4,500 volts. If I was using a neon sign transformer, this wouldn't be a problem. But because I'm not using a rotary spark gap or not, because I'm not using a neon sign transformer, which operates at like 10,000, 12,000 volts, I need to go a lot smaller, a lot smaller. Oh boy, 0.0625. Okay, yeah, that's good. So a 16th of an inch is pretty standard. I mean, pretty, st not standard, is a pretty big gap for a microwave oven transformer setup to do. And you could also choose the electrogeometry if you're, if the heads of your spark gap electrodes are rounded, like the head of a bolt or something, then you want to click round here. But if they're flat, like the end of a bolt, then you want to click flat. And that's usually what I end up with. And yeah, so that changes things a little bit when you click that, as you can see. And now that we've talked about pretty much everything, we run Java TC, da 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 da, yep, all good. Now, I don't want to lose this stuff that I just typed out, so what we're going to want to do is format this design as text, and all your stuff is right here, in here. Now, they used to be able to let you download this as like a text file, and you could upload it back into Java TC, which is nice, but for some reason, either something has changed or I got dumber. So what we do is we select this text, there's a little select text button right here, and we copy it, control C, you copy and paste that into a document, and then uh, if you forget to do that, you have to start all over again. If your text is orange, you can click on it, and it'll give you a little website. Website, right? Yep, it will sh it'll provide a little bit of information here. So anything that is in yellow text, you can actually click on, and it will show you some information. How do I get out of here, bro? That's our Java TC tutorial. I hope you found this helpful and uh, entertaining, I guess. I don't know. Probably not. It's Java TC. But this will help you a lot, a lot, a lot in your Tesla coil building process. Uh, also, this will only work with DRSSTCs and SGTCs. If you are building a DRSSTC, you actually don't have to worry about anything uh, from this point on. No, no not for from this point on, you don't have to worry about it if you're building a DRSSTC. Just this stuff up. So, anyway, yep, there's your Java TC tutorial. I hope you found it helpful, and uh, I will see you in the next video. I should probably apologize that this isn't a more entertaining video. We did have something filmed, and then we lost the footage. Stuff just happens, but we do actually have a really, really exciting July 4th special in mind. And I won't spoil too much, but... It